Hello everyone, welcome back to the course on quantum theory of many body systems in condensed matter. My name is Luis Gregorio Diaz here at the Institute of Physics at the University of Sao Paulo. And in today's class, we're going to go over time order Green's functions and Wick's theorem. So this class is a lot about the formalism. So we're going to introduce the time order Green's functions relate to, to the retarded and advanced Green's functions that we saw in a previous class and also related to the lesser and greater Green's functions that we, we saw it, we saw before. And then uh, I'm going to argue why are we using time order Green's functions? And the answer will be that it's very convenient to do perturbation theory using those types of Green's functions. So we're going to motivate that by formulating a very famous theorem in quantum field theory, the Gelman and Lowe theorem, and argue that uh, we, that allows us to, to calculate these time order Green's functions as an expansion in some perturbation. Very similar to what we did in linear response. And the example that we're going to, to do here is to use interaction. And to treat that and, and write this expansion as in terms of other Green's functions, we're going to formulate Wick's theorem. Uh, and it will be useful for us to uh, express this perturbation expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams. And that is going to be the topic of the next class. All right, so let's dive right on it. So let's introduce the time order Green's functions at t equals zero, at zero temperature. And we're going to discuss the case of finite temperatures later in the course. So the time order Green's functions at a position r time t, position r prime time t prime, is this defined as minus i times the expected value at the ground state of the time ordering of the product of a destruction field operator acting on position r time t times the creation field operator acting on r prime t prime okay so notice that here we're writing the time order green's functions in the basis of position you you can change the basis actually it doesn't have to be r and r prime it can be any two indices and then you would define here destruction and creator operators in say of a state k and k prime would be the same then you set of g r r prime would be g k and k prime right but is always on a time t prime and a time t and this product is defined within a time ordering operator we introduced this time ordering operator before uh when we discussed the uh interaction picture but here there's a slightly uh, different definition that we are now allowing for these to be uh, individual operators while there we're talking about hamiltonians for individual operators which can be fermionic for instance there will be a minus sign here when if you time order this product in this order ak at time t ak prime dagger at time t prime it will re remain in this order with no additional sign whatsoever if t is larger than this t prime but it will exchange the order it will then take the operator at the 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 later time the latter time before and the operator in the previous time after so if t prime is larger than t the order will be a k prime dagger at t prime times a k t but since there was a permutation from the original original ordering to the result i get a minus sign if these two operators are fermionic so that's the only difference so we, we have to keep track of this minus sign when uh, the final time ordered uh, time ordered result is has an 
odd number of exchanges of fermionic operators as relative to the original ordering. Okay, so this is an important point. Now, what's the connection with the other other Green's functions that we saw in the previous class? And I'll try to remember to put the link here. Uh, remember that uh, we saw this uh, definition for the greater Green's functions, for instance, or the lesser, which would be uh, plus i or minus i here. In this case, it was minus i for the greater, times an expected value, and at t equals 0, this expected value is at the ground state, of a destruction operator at position r time t times a creation operator at position r prime t prime. So if t is larger than t prime, that's the order that our time order operator gives us, and then we'll get the greater the greater Green, Green's functions. Remember that the greater Green's functions was always defined as such. It doesn't matter whether t or t prime, t was larger than t prime or vice versa. So here it does depend if t is larger than t prime, the time order Green's functions is equal to the greater Green's functions. But if t is less than t prime, it will be equal to the lesser Green's functions, which we define as this. So we start to, to see this connection between uh, this time order Green's functions and the greater and lesser Green's functions that we defined before. And we're going to use this connection to write the time order Green's functions in the Lyman representation, which we also defined in that previous class. And here I'm talking about the Lyman representation at t equals zero. So I strongly suggest that you would go over to that link and, and watch it again. So just to remind you, we're talking about an expansion in the many particle spectrum of the full Hamiltonian, right? So imagine that for some reason we are allowed to, to have the full many particle spectrum for, uh, uh, related to this Hamiltonian. And then we can calculate matrix elements such as this for any operator, okay, say a k dagger between two states. And here I'm taking the ground state, so the energy is zero. So essentially I'm essentially setting the ground state energy to zero and all the other uh, states are excitations with energies above zero, okay. So in this case, uh, we can write the, the greater Green's functions as this. So it will be a sum in the spectrum of operators going from the ground state uh, or a matrix element connecting the ground state with the state alpha times the matrix element of the creation operator at state M connecting the state alpha with the ground state. And all that, since we are at zero temperature, there is no uh, Boltzmann factor, right? But there will be the, the, the one that comes from time evolution, which is e to the minus i e alpha, the energy of this state, times t minus t prime. So this is the Lyman representation for the greater Green's functions. And in frequency, of course, we can take the Fourier transform and then I get this extra 2 pi and then I'll get a delta function here uh, at a frequency omega minus the energy of the state alpha. So this is a, essentially a sum of delta functions times the, say, the expected value square or the the modulus modulus square of a k alpha zero okay since th this is the complex conjugate of this okay so it's a series of delta functions times a a intensity right which is the absolute value square of this thing okay so with that we can we can see how we can write the, the time order Green's functions in the Lyman representation. 
Just another point, we also learn how to write both the retarded and the advanced Green's functions for, say, k and m here. It's k, uh, yeah, here I put k and k prime, essentially copy these from the previous class. But let's, let's take k and m, for instance. And we derived that uh, from the relationship of the greater and the lesser in Green's functions, we could write the retarded and the advanced in this form, and we use that quite a lot, uh, which is the same uh, product of matrix elements that we had before, except that here I have uh, the a sum, right, of this that connects zero to alpha by via the destruction operator while this one essentially connects the ground state to alpha by a create creation operator so this is usually referred to as a electron like or particle like term so that you're destroying a particle at alpha and connecting it to the ground state while here you are creating a particle at alpha and connecting it to the ground state. So it's like if you have holes or antiparticles, if you want, here in this, this state. So you are, you are uh, connecting this oh, via holes, while here you are essentially connecting with electrons. And the denominator will have here a minus sign in, in this term. So it's positive energies, right? So whenever omega is equals to e alpha while here you have omega plus e alpha so this is essentially has poles when omega equals minus e alpha so sometimes we refer this to quote unquote negative energies or whole energies if you want but we already went over this and again if we were talking about the retarded you have this plus i eta and then you have to take eta to zero and go into the into the real axis while if you want to have the advanced case then this is minus eta so you are taking uh, poles slightly below the real axis instead of slightly above and we also discussed why that is and you know, depending on the whether t is larger than t prime uh, you, you, you need this plus or minus i eta in the exponent so that your Fourier transform is well behaved. All right, uh, so uh, we did all this derivation from taking the relationship be between retarded and advanced Greek functions with greater and lesser ones. Now, what about the time ordered Green's functions? Well, uh, it turns out that there's a very similar uh, expression here, except for the signs of the, these imaginary parts. So we're going to show that in the assignment that you, you can write that time order Green's functions in the Lyman representation and it will be very similar to either the retarder or the advanced Green's functions except that for positive omega, right? So these omega minus E alpha positive energies or the particle-like uh, uh, terms will behave like the retarded case where you have plus i while the whole like uh, contributions or negative omega right omega equals minus e alpha will get this minus sign which is the one from from advanced Green's functions uh, in other words you can always go back from the time ordered Green's functions to to the retarded one, say, if you are focusing on this term. So if you if you're talking about particle like transitions, that's what you get. You you would get the 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 retarded Green's functions at that, that particular frequency. But if you're now talking about whole uh, whole like uh, terms to get the retarded Green's functions, you would need to, to take the, the complex conjugate of that. So, in other words, uh, we 
new and that's the I think the important point here that when we're talking we're talking about things that you want to calculate say in linear response you always are talking about retarded uh, green functions or retarded correlation functions so what I'm saying here is that okay if you if you have somehow calculated the time ordered one you can go back to the retarded by doing this trick okay so just remember that you still you you, you need to take the analytic continuation correctly here in order to, to recover uh, the retarded one and now the question is okay but why not calculate the retarded one directly right instead of you know having to worry about this the sign of the poles and contours in a complex plane and, and whatnot why not calculating the the retarded one first what's the advantage of calculating this this one and it turns out that there is an advantage an advantage of using the time order Green's function is that you can calculate it in perturbation theory uh, in a very elegant way in other words it's very appropriate to use that in perturbation theory and say you have a Hamiltonian which has a main term H0 plus a perturbation H1 and uh, you know the spectrum or at least the ground state for H0 right so let's say that you you know the ground state well, what I'm saying here in this slide is that you can express the time order Green's functions as a perturbative series in different orders of H1, and you are always evaluating this uh, matrix elements in a state that you know, which is a ground state of the non interacting case. So there is a, this expression is. It's rather long, but we're going to go through that. Why, why you have all, all these terms? You have, you know, this sum over from n equals to zero, from zero to infinity on the numerator, and you have this expected value of a uh, time evolution operator in the interaction picture that we are, we are familiar with this one when we discuss the interaction picture try to remember to put the link here but this is appears in the denominator here okay important point here is that everything is calculated as an expected value in the ground state of the non-interacting system and while in the definition of the, the time order Green's functions we have the, the, the operators written in the Heisenberg picture now in this product here they're all written in the interaction picture okay so even ak and ak dagger m are writ the time evolution is written in the interaction picture which evolves with the Hamiltonian that we know which is h naught okay and just to remind you that the time evolution operator in the interaction picture is itself a perturbative series in h1 so this order 0 in H1, this order 1 in H1, this order 2 in H1, and so on and so forth. And we discussed that, how we can look at this as a, a series of, say, uh, we call them diagrams, quote-unquote. And that's precisely the same spirit here. But this gives you uh, a, a nice way to put these operators in terms of orders of this, uh, this perturbation. Okay, so right, and then you can. Uh, I'm gonna argue that you can even uh, calculate the the Green's functions itself as a series like this one. Uh, it will be a series in terms of the non-interacting Green's functions, but it will be different orders of H one and. The point that uh, in the next few slides we're going to make is how do we get this expression? Okay, why this big hunk of an expression where if we had that, you know, innocent looking definition for 
a Green's function is just like the retarded one. How do we end up with something like that? And this is uh, a bit more formal, but it's very instructive to know where this comes from. Well, the idea here is to remember that the Green's functions, the time order Green's functions, is essentially a expected value of Heisenberg operators. Okay, and what we're going to do is to provide a way to relate expected values in the Heisenberg picture with expected values of time order operators in the in the interaction picture. For that, uh, let's start with uh, the so-called adiabatic switching on of the states, right? Because the difference between the Heisenberg and interaction pictures is how we treat the interactions. So let's say that we have an interaction that is essentially zero at t equals plus and minus infinity. All right, and and then it is turns on so that when t equals zero, it reaches a maximum. So this is what is represented here by this Hamiltonian. So we I added this explicit time dependence here as a prefactor to the perturbation that we want, so that this is the absolute value of the time. So if time is minus infinity, uh, this is zero. Okay, so I, my Hamiltonian equals to the h naught that we want. So at minus infinity, the Heisenberg and interaction pictures are similar, essentially the same. That and the same also happens at t equals plus infinity when this you know goes to zero and I, h equals h naught. But at time t equals zero, I have my perturbation, right? This is zero, so this is one, and I have h zero to h one. So in principle, if I evolve from minus infinity to zero, I'm going from a Hamiltonian which was essentially at equals h zero to something that is equal to h zero plus h one, right? So let's remember the interaction picture here. Uh, and if I want to evolve, say, from minus infinity to zero, I would have to have, this is my, my, my interaction, quote unquote, right? So my time evolution operator will involve this ether here. And hopefully I can do that. And at the end of, the, of everything, I'll, I'll turn ether, I'll take the limit of ether going to zero so that this is uh, not time dependent anymore, but let's let's leave that for later. So my time evolution operator in the interaction picture looks like that, right? T equals to t zero equals one minus uh, first order in h one times this uh, explicit time dependence, and we went through that. Plus second order, then there will be a time dependence from in absolute values of t1 and t2, right? Because I have now a second order process and so on and so forth. So if I want to evolve it from a time t0 to a time t, that's the operator that I need to apply to my state in the interaction picture. And remember, this is the evolution for this one. Is This is related to, to, to the, the state at the Schrodinger picture at the same time t, by multiplying this with e to the plus i h naught t. Yeah, oh, there's an h bar here. Sorry, this should be 1. So, at t equals 0, right, when this interaction is maximum, what do I get? Well, now my states at, at the interaction picture and the, and the Schrodinger picture are the same, right? So, what I'm doing here is now this at equals zero is this, the evolution from minus infinity to zero from my original state way back at minus infinity. In my original state at 
minus infinity is the ground state say of a of this guy right so that's what I'm, I'm trying to 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 calculate is at my t equals minus infinity the Hamiltonian is h naught so at that point in time the spectrum is essentially at the one at h naught and the ground state for the Hamilton total Hamiltonian is this now I evolve from this one to all the way to time zero where the Hamiltonian is no longer h naught but something else but if this evolution is smooth whatever is the result here should be and right and that's the the, the, the whole point here should be related to at least one state not necessarily a ground state but at least a state of the full interacting Hamiltonian and that's the point that we want to make but in principle this is all formal right I can evolve from minus infinity to zero and and this is the ground state for H naught now let's take a look at the connection between this time evolved state from minus infinity to zero starting from the ground state of H naught and this we're going to call it psi right and the thing that we want to show is that this state is an angular state of the interacting Hamiltonian right with a full interacting Hamiltonian and what states that this this is a, a, a eigenstate not necessarily the ground state but a eigenstate of H is a so-called Gelman and Lowe theorem which is very important in a very important theorem in quantum field theory and will help us uh, you know express the, the time ordered um, Green's functions in terms of in, in the interaction picture now let, let, let me guide you through the, the steps and I'm not going to prove the Gelman and Lowe theorem here uh, the proof is shown in the book by Fetter and Baleka uh, chapter 3 uh, also was introduced in this famous paper by Gelman and Lowe in, in the 50s but the idea is the following let's define this quantity which is the limit of eta going to zero of the time evolution from minus infinity to zero for a given eta right of the ground state of h naught at minus infinity evolved to zero divided by the overlap between this state and the ground state of h naught phi zero okay so if this quantity exists is defined and right doesn't explode for instance when this if this overlap doesn't it's always non-zero right from during this time evolution if this happens and so you have this uh, smooth time evolution from this state to that state and we can define this in all orders of perturbation theory right in 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 h1 then you can prove that this state it is in fact an eigenstate of h not necessarily the ground state but it is uh, an eigenstate of h right with a full perturbation here uh, with a given energy e okay so uh, this is crucial because now we we if we can uh, do this time evolution and we in this time evolution can be done in, in different orders of h1 we have uh, uh, we we are certain that this will evolve to to an eigens not to any state but to an eigenstate of the of h and that's a very powerful theorem and let me add that usually not always but usually this time evolved state will be the ground state of h as well if you start in the ground state of h naught and my t my equals minus infinity and it i say that the the theorem doesn't guarantee that 
but unless you have some special conditions such as degeneracy in the ground state or uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking or, or something like that uh, uh, then it's usually uh, the case that this time evolved state will be the ground state and that will, will be crucial for us to define the the Green's functions later because remember the time order Green's functions is defined as a expected value in the interacting ground state of the system. So let's now uh, take a look of one important corollary of the Gelman and Lowe theorem. The corollary is as this and that's the connection that we want to make. Uh, you can show that if you have an expected value of a time ordered product of two operators written in the Heisenberg picture with respect to that um, say the ground state of the interacting Hamiltonian uh, you can express this in terms of a expected value of involving the ground state of H0, of the non-interacting Hamiltonian, which is, you know, solves your, uh, you know, helps you a big deal, because now you were talking about a uh, expected value that you know how to calculate, okay? Of course, what enters in here involves not only these two operators in now written in interaction picture, but involves a perturbative series in, in the interaction. But okay, that's the price you have to pay. And also there's this important uh, uh, factor here in the denominator, which is the expected value of, of the time evolution operator going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you say, well, this should be one, right? Yes, it should be one if this thing is normalized, but I'll leave it here because this is going to be important to be important when you want to cancel some diagrams that arise from from this uh, the numerator here. Now the important thing about here, and, and I'm, I'm not going to prove this this uh, relationship is also uh, you can find it in in Fetter and Vilek as well. But it it does relate, you know, our Green's functions that we write in the Heisenberg uh, picture and as a expected value in the ground state of an interacting system with a perturbative series with a matrix elements calculated in the non-interacting ground state. And well, with that corollary, I can directly write my time order Green's functions. Remember there was a minus i times a expected value. I transferred the minus i to plus i on the left side. So I have i times the, the Green's functions. I'll try to, to stick with this notation so that all that appears here in the, the right hand side is a expected value over the ground state of the non-interacting system. And this is crucial. Okay. So Let's start with an example for a, a, a concrete example for an H1, which we'll call the, the perturbation. And I'm going to choose a quartic term, an interaction term. So let's consider the case where my H0 is a quadratic uh, Hamiltonian diagonal, say, and my H1 inv involves, say, Coulomb Coulomb interactions. And in fact, you know, this is a Coulomb uh, matrix elements, K and M, K prime, M prime. And we went through that when we, we learned how to write two body operators in the second quantized form. And let's go to the blackboard and work out this example and see at least the first two, the first term in, in perturbation theory coming out of this right hand side here so let's go to the to the blackboard and take a look uh, remember that uh, you know the this uh, 
time evolution operator is already the one with either taken to be zero. So uh, here is just all these time uh, integrals are from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so let's go to the blackboard and and work out this example and and you see what I mean. So let's go back to the example where we had the uh, interacting perturbation, okay? the perturbation as an interacting term. So the first order term would be something like that, as I mentioned, would involve six operators in the time ordering uh, form. Okay, yeah, so the question that we want to ask is how can Weak's theorem be applied to this case of six operators, three of them creation operators and three of them destruction operators in this particular order, right? A k prime, a m prime, a m2 prime, a k2 prime, all of these at time t1, same time, and these other two at different times, a k at time t, a, and a dagger m at time t prime. So let's see how we can apply Wick's theorem here. And for simplicity, I only do pairings of a, a dagger term and a non-dagger term, because we know that all the other terms that involve pairings between uh, two uh, destruction operators or two creation operators, they will get me zero, okay? So let's let's start this. So the first thing I'm going to do is to remind you what's the non-interacting Green's functions here. So the non-interacting Green's functions, and we wrote that in the previous slides, something like that. I g not uh, say k m at t t prime is what is this time ordered of a k t a m dagger t prime okay so let's keep that in mind because i'd like to to get things like this in the products and write this whole thing in terms of these pairings. So let, let's start with this one, right? This pairing here. So let's get down a little bit. Yeah, I'm, you know what? I'm gonna copy this and put it right down there. Just a sec. There, okay. All right, I think, I think it's still on, on your screen here. All right, so let's scroll down and start doing the the pairing so first thing i'm gonna write is the pairing that involves the this combination okay and there will be two of them uh i mean pairings that involve this a k t a m t prime so then i'll need to to pair to get the other two pairings that involve a dagger with a non-dagger for this and there will be two combinations let let me write them and they will appear to you just like by magic okay so these are the terms so there is this one which i pair a k prime with a m two prime and m prime the only pairing possible now that is non zeros m prime with a k double prime now let's look at the 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 sign here okay so this is minus one how many permutations do i need to go from here to here so the first rule of thumb is if i look at the pairs if the pair is in the same order, then as as in as in the as in above, then this doesn't count. 
because you know I can move pairs pairs around and don't get any minus sign because I'm, I'm moving a pair so it's like a boson okay so this doesn't count so I, I need just need to look at the order of these four compared to the order that are there so here there is to pair k prime with m two prime I need to do one permutation m two prime with m prime so this gets close to k prime and this this one gets to close to k double prime and I get this so I have one permutation here now in the other one which is I'm pairing k prime with m two with k double prime then it would be two right because I would need to exchange these two and then exchange k double prime that is here with m two prime to bring it closer to a k prime so this is minus one to a power of two so these two have opposite signs all right let's keep going next is I'd like to pair what let's pair say t a k at t with one of these dagger operators here let's say I pair it with a k prime dagger at t1 okay so this would give me a Green's functions which would have indices k and k prime and times t and t1 at the end I'm all, always gonna gonna write these uh, pairings in this form with a destruction operator coming first and uh, well, the destruction coming first and the creation coming later so that I can relate that to, to Green's functions uh, here is you know is not gonna be a problem because it would be just you know two exchanges and we'll, uh, since I have you know these two in the normal terms so it will get me the, the same phase but let's try to focus here on, on on this form like I'm always thinking of a and a dagger so what would be the the two terms that involve a pairing like this so let's take a look there so have these other two terms so I'm pairing AK AK with AK prime AK at T AK prime at T1 dagger then I'm pairing uh, AM with AM double prime and then the the only thing that's left is AK double prime to with M let's figure out the sign right how many permutations so I have so yeah let's put, put the plus signs here so there's this there's a minus one here and a permutation how many so to to get this one in front of k double prime I need one two three four permutations I'm left with so these other these two go out I'm left with the other ones to get m double prime in front of m prime I need another one five this go out and I'm left with k double prime m so that's okay so this is five all right now next let's figure out sign minus one to put k here I know that's four so let's see how many more I, I need in order to get this ordering so in order to get k double prime in front of m prime I need another two one two so six and I'm left with m double prime m so this is six oops let's put in orange okay notice that these two have opposite signs like these two 
and I'm already uh, put this in, a, in the form that I want, the destruction first, dagger last. Okay, now let's finally get the final pairing that I need, which is... Um, Let's see, I have AK with AM, I have AK with this guy, and I now, the last pairing that I need is, oh, sorry. Oh, notice that I'm forgetting all, all the expected values. I'll, I'll put that later. It's, uh, I'm just doing the pairings right now. So the last one I want is a k of t with the one that is missing, which is a m prime dagger at t1. Okay. Let's put it. Give me more space. A m prime dagger at t1. So let's magically calculate. The other there will be two terms here already, but the, the other two, and we already expect them to have uh, opposite signs. So let's see what it, we get there. And now I'm already put the the signs for you as expected. You can check yourself later. But they ex as expected, they have different signs. So I now have written using Vick's theorem this pairing of six terms in one, two, three, four, five, six pairings of two operators each. And these are, are the six terms that I have. And I can write then the in first order at least what would be the Green's functions uh, here uh, with this term so putting everything together so let's do that in another slide so we're in a, in a position to start writing the Green's functions at least the first two terms so this is an approximation okay and of course we have this denominator here we'll discuss it later but the, f the first term the n equals zero term we understood that is just the, the non-interacting term okay now comes the n equal one term which has u has the sum over k prime m prime k double prime and m double prime okay this integral from minus infinity to infinity in dt1, and then those six terms that we just calculate, that they will involve Green's functions. So let's take a look at them and, and see what we put here. So this is my n equals one term, the integral that I already put on the other side. And all, is, all of this can be summarized by these six terms down here. So let's start writing them in terms of non-interacting Green's functions. So this one, when I do the, of course, there is a big uh, expected value here, right? That goes all the way down here. Let me see if you're seeing this. Yes, you should know all the way down here. So it means that this term, for instance, will give me what? Will give me uh, I G0 of K and M at T at T prime. Okay? This and this, these two. Here and here. Okay? This one will give me I G K prime m double prime t1 t1 okay so it's the same time same time green's function so well 
This one is also going to be a same time the greens functions t1 t1 and uh, we're going to see that these two uh, when it, whenever you have same times they they're not too important i mean they get canceled out and eventually all right uh these two are also same time but this they have different index this is k prime k double prime t1 t1 and this is i j m prime m double prime t1 t1 okay now what about these ones notice that this will have a minus minus sign and this will have a plus okay all right these guys here they'll have yeah let, let me change colors a little bit I'll try to change colors here oh no forget it this guy is going to be i jk jk prime tt1 oh that's more interesting this is going to be j m double prime m prime t1 t1 and this is going to be i g k double prime t1 t prime this is not going to be k prime k double prime m now this is interesting because it involves t1 and t prime while this goes from t to t1 okay this is kind of closed loop but uh, this is interesting okay now if we start doing all of that with the other terms here with all six terms we can start filling out uh, the the bracket there in the Green's functions and that's precisely what we're going to do now okay just a minor correction here uh, the indices here in the Green's functions always refer to first the index of the destruction operator and time the first time is also the time of the destruction operator second index is the index of the creation operator second time is the index of the creation operator okay so here for instance is g m double prime at t1 k prime at t1 so if we now transform all these into non-interacting greens functions with the correct index indices and times this will count these terms of three greens functions multiplied notice the the i here is that that should be counted these terms of three products of three greens functions will enter my n equals one expansion and let's see how that works the first order term in the interacting greens functions there so this is the first term and i included here all the six terms one two three four five six with hopefully the correct indices and correct times uh, and the correct signs of each term due to the permutation right so we have this is minus this is plus this is minus this is plus this is plus this is minus essentially doing if we go back here sorry for the strip but it's essentially this minus plus minus plus plus minus all right so what have we learned so far so this is the expression up to first order in terms of the non-interacting greens functions right i'm writing the interacting greens functions as this expansion this is the zero order term this is the n equals one the first order term i could go to second order then you know it would be how let, let's see right so at first order I already have six operators here so three greens functions in second order i would have what i would have two h ones four operators each so that's eight plus the the two so that's ten so that means five greens functions which makes sense right one three five that's the but there will be many many more terms so 
the way we did it, you know, to account for the signs, notice that there is this, I haven't multiplied the, the imaginary factors here. So there will be other minus signs with imaginary parts and so on. There is also this minus i here. But let's not, uh, the, the, the important point is that I can, in principle, calculate this if I know the, an expression for G not the non-interacting Green's functions. And I could go to, you know, second order, third order, if I have, you know, uh, the will to do it. So in the next class, we're going to see how we can construct this in a more efficient way using Feynman diagrams. And in particular, we're going to see that many of these terms will cancel out with similar terms that are coming from this denominator. And so we don't have to go through all this work, you know, of applying Wick's theorem to, to the individual terms in the series to, to, to get an expression for G in terms of G naught. It will be a simpler expression, but still it's a lot of work. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll see you in the next class where we'll discuss how to express this in terms of Feynman diagrams. See you there.